I am Travis Thurston. I'm an instructional designer in the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction here at USU in the uh, Academic and Instructional Services. Uh, so I get to work with a lot of faculty uh, in their courses and I am really excited to be here uh, and, and to learn from all of you. Uh, I get to introduce Rodney today. Rodney Marchant is a Utah native who has served in the U.S. Air Force, driven truck for the past 18 years, uh, taught English, right? Uh, he holds a master's in rhetoric and composition from St. Cloud University and is currently writing his dissertation on the importance of rhetoric, process, and theory in the writing classroom. Uh, Rodney, Rodney writes poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, and is currently working on a screenplay and a composition textbook. I'll give the floor to Rodney. All right, haven't done this for a while. Um, I did have a PowerPoint I was going to show you from one of my f uh, former group of students. Unfortunately, when I pulled it up to play it this morning, I can't get the sound to work. And without the sound, the PowerPoint is just going to be a bunch of spaces that aren't, uh, wouldn't be for, uh, right for me to present on. So I'm um, going to pull that one out. But I'm going to kind of get you into this. Um, I wanted to talk to you about how I got into problem-based learning because Problem-based learning, in, in my viewpoint, is, is where classrooms need to get to. Because too often, what I found out as is, is I went back to school is that I was given theoretical situations that I had to come up with a theoretical uh, problem to solve, and they just meant nothing to me. And so I, I decided about nine years ago um, that I would not give my students something that they could not sink their teeth into. And so I started having them come up with their own ideas of what they wanted to get into. The problem with when I did that one is, is that they went a little bit too far and I had to rein them back in. So I started putting some uh, structure into it, but still tried to let them come up with their own ideas. So as I was getting into this, I, one day I, sat, I found myself sitting in a classroom teaching a lecture, using a textbook, and what I didn't find in the classroom was the excitement that I used to have. I was, I was bored. And so I, I said, there has to be a different way to do this. And what came to mind is, is literally I was teaching somebody else's material, and I was not teaching what I thought was important. And so I threw the textbook out which concerned my uh, bosses at that time until they came and sat in my classroom and started seeing what came out of it. And so I threw the textbook out and I stopped choosing the research topics that they had with this one change. I started trying to make the information that they were going to be researching pertinent to what they were doing, what was important to them. And as I have slowly becoming, uh, as I am, I should say, slowly becoming a screaming environmentalist um, and s sustainability nut, I started looking around the world and, and seeing that we have issues that we're dealing with here at home. Every one of us in this room, every one of our students have issues that they're dealing with. Uh, for instance, Cache Valley is an enclosed atmosphere. And there are a lot of people, in, and I used to be one of these, that come wintertime, I'm driving my four-wheel drive. And my four-wheel drive is a 1989 three-quarter ton GMC. And if you think that it's pollution sensitive, you're wrong. Um, I get about 12 miles per gallon, uh, and it is, it is not a good thing. And so if you've, if you've worked here long enough, you notice that, the, that you can taste the air rather than just breathing in the air. And so my students um, in this last semester actually took that one, that, that issue that was uh, of, of concern to them because their breathing was being affected. If you have allergies um, or if you have lung problems, the air up in, in, in the valley is, is very difficult to breathe and can cause some health problems. And so I let them take that local issue that we have here study that, and look outside themselves for global solutions. 
who has dealt with this in the past or in other places and begin to use this. Um, and so they started choosing their subjects and they brought them home and again started looking at local issues, global solutions. And that was the focus of my class, uh, which can become problematic because that is the focus of my class. And when my students say, can you, can you elaborate on that one, I would say, I really can't. Because you need to look at the issue, find out what's, imper what's important about it, uh, what's the pertinent bit of information, and you need to uh, work to find those solutions yourself. I will guide you as much as I can, but I can't give you the answers to this. Uh, because I wanted it to, them to make it their own. So, you know, problem-based learning became a major focus in my classroom. And, and it gave my students uh, the ability to reach out and grab hold of something that was important. The second thing that it did, and, and really important, we were having a discussion um, at lunch today about this one, is it took the audience of that discussion and took it off of me. It was no longer, I was no longer their audience, and it put it back on, uh, on somebody else, a real audience, somebody they could talk to. Uh, because one of the things that happens in my classroom with problem-based learning is, I'm a writing classroom. Um, this is for my English 2010 students. We do research, uh, kind of mandatory that they learn how to find information and they learn how to address an audience. Um, and if the audience is me, it's a theoretical audience, not, not a, a, an actual audience that is important to that issue. And so they would find that audience, they would then write them a letter and invite them to come hear the presentations which they do at the end. And so they would create a PowerPoint that is literally a sales pitch. This is what the situation is. This is how it became. This is where it stands. And this is what we need to do to fix it. And so, and they would pitch that to a community leader. Or they would pitch that to a business um, executive. Or they would pick, pitch that to a government agency. Um, as they've invited them to the class. And the fun part is, is when they actually show up, because I can't guarantee that one. But I've had a uh, representative from, uh, uh, our, our, uh, from the state legislature and from the, and, and the governor's office come and, and sit in on the class and ask them things. UTA has been into one of my classes to hear what they're talking about when they start talking about how do we make something sustainable uh, with the bus system that we have and the fact that they're diesel, and diesel does not burn clean. Um, and so we wanted to get into electric buses and, and putting charging stations in so that we can have more of electric power rather than the, the diesel power going on. So they have that, that audience who is an actual audience um, there. And what I found out is, is when they moved the audience from me to an actual business entity or an actual person who deals with this situation, the papers that they began writing were more focused, more to the point, more directed, the, the language level was raised, and they began talk, uh, speaking uh, much more clearly about the topic, and they had better ideas coming out. So kind of a, a, of a background of how I got started in this. Yeah? Um, comparing to um, your, you know, the, um, the traditional curriculum instruction, it sounds like you became a facilitator in your, in your classroom. Absolutely. Then, you know, um, the, uh, professor. So did you, have you found that your time has been expended more um, to teach that class? Or I just wanted to know, with a traditional classroom, it sounds like you're going to have to put more time to different problems for each student's problem. Yeah, and I'm actually going to go over that because I'm going to go over the classroom format because I think I think it's important. Classroom format is is um, and format and assignment is, is really that way. What I my my traditional classroom format was is I would come in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. On Monday, I would lecture to my students about the rhetorical tool that we were going to be studying at that time. Wednesday, we would come and I would talk to them about um, uh, you know, the, the, the ideas that, that we're looking at in the research area of it. 
And then Friday we'd get together and do group work. Now what I do is I come in and I will talk to them about 10 to 15 minutes and get the class all set up and then you know it's like okay groups and you know the little motion is circle up get into your groups and we're going to discuss and then I will give them a series of prompts which is what I want you to do today um, and this is one example of this is when my students come in the the first Wednesday of class they are going to come in and I'm going to say okay I want you to get into groups of three or four and as you're in this group of three or four I want you to think of something that you can sell now, I don't use sell as money is going to be exchanging, but it can. I want you to come up with a product, an idea, a theology, a political standpoint that you can sell. And as a group, decide what that is. Now decide who is the real life audience for that product. Okay? And as you're going to do that, I want you to then look at the demographics of them. Who are they? Are they young or are they old? Um, are they uh, religious? Are they non-religious? Is it a political entity? Is it another thing? And pinpoint that I, that audience. Okay. Now that you have pinpoint, you pinpointed that audience. What I want you to do is decide what tools it's going to take to get them to buy into that idea and purchase it. Now, whether that purchase is with cash or whether it's with a vote in the ballot box, um, it, it doesn't matter, but how do you, how do you get that coming out? So they, they look at those things, and I walk around from group to group, and I sit in and I talk to them, which means what, one of the things that it did is, because remember if I told you, uh, that I told you that my, I got bored in class, and a teacher should never be bored in class. Uh, because we're just not at our best when we are. And so as I go from group to group, and I'll have 23 students in the class, and if I've got four, I've got about six groups, I have to have my mind ready to shift from this idea to this idea to this idea to this idea. My brain becomes more active, and I begin thinking, and I'm able to, to work six things. So I have to be ready, and, and the nice part about it is, is while... I'm facilitating the discussions for them. They're educating me on their issues that, that they're dealing with. And so, uh, you know, they will send in, every week they will send in uh, a blog posting that has an article that they've read, their summary of what was said, and, and their viewpoint on that, uh, on that article. So I'm reading multiple articles every week. Um, and multiple summaries and everything else. So I'm becoming a lot more interactive. So it does take a lot more time, but it's a whole lot more fun. And, and I think, you know, if, if I'm engaged in, in the classroom, my students are more likely to be engaged as well. And so I kind of do that way. Here's my general course assignment setup, because in my 2010, it's a writing class. And, and although I hate to say this because I'm excited about writing, if I were to say, raise your hands, all of you who love to write, I might get a couple of people that, that come up. I write because it's, a, it's just a ball. I like to connect ideas to an audience and reel them in. I like snaring people, um, which is really kind of what, I, what we do when we write an argumentative essay. We, we, we use different types of bait to lure them in, and then we start tying them down. Um, and so the first thing that I have them do, and this is going to say, if you've been a graduate student, this sounds really clear to you, I have them do a lit review. The first few weeks of the course is always a lit review. They go out there and they need to find a topic that's just going to excite them, something they can sink their teeth into that they want to work on. This fall, this is what they're working on. Um, because I'm a sustainability nut, I think that we need to fix things so that people have them in the future. Not just so I can use them now, but so they're there for other people in the future. But what is going on this fall that everybody's paying attention to? The football, oh no, the presidential election. I wish it was the football. Um, it's the presidential election. Um, and the conversation is going something like this. I don't like any of them. Who do we, well, what are we going to do? So it's, it's politics. We have to have politics. Um, I'm also a big believer in cross-disciplinary 
um, focus. I like to grab things because, again, the majority of my students are not English majors. If I get one class, I'm doing really good. Uh, if I get two, I think I'm in heaven. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's people are coming in from different disciplines. And so, you know, we do a lit review, and they're going, their lit review is going to literally be, they're going to find, I should say, their aspect that, that they're going to work with is going to be an issue that's being discussed in this election that, you know, has, that, that deals with them directly. Something that, that's going to affect their lives. And so they're going to take that aspect and they're going to do a lit review. Who, what's being talked about? Who's writing about it? What's being said? And they're going to, they're going to talk about it and find out what's being, what's being talked about out there. So they're going to do a lit review and they're going to write that up. Um, and lit reviews, I think, are, are the easiest thing for them to do because they can tell me what they've read. And we need to get a couple of weeks to go through and do this one, and they're going to find at least 10 different articles that are being talked about on that one aspect or issue in, involved in the campaigns, and they're going to write that up. Number two, they're, at that point in time, they're going to write a research proposal telling me what they want to research, why they want to research it, who are the people that are, that are involved in the conversation, the power players that are actually talking, you know, what effects they see coming out, and maybe what they see needing to be done. And I let them have, leave the last bit open because argument is a two-sided discussion where both parties have an open mind. If both parties don't have an open mind, it becomes that shouting match that we had with our parents when we were younger. You know, mom and dad say, you can't go out and, and you can't go out and do this. And we say, why can't I go out and do this? And they say, because I'm your parent and I said so. And I've yet to meet a kid who that made sense to. Um, and then it's like, you never loved me anyway. And so they, they do the research proposal. They look at the issue. They look at the opposing, the opposing sides and viewpoints, and they look at the, the solution of that one, tentative solution. And so, you know, all English, um, all something we're going to get to, but then I have them branch out. And the next thing I have them do is I write, they, have, they write a, socio, a social science paper. They write a historical review of that conversation because issues don't happen overnight, ever. Issues happen over time. Things break down, they don't get fixed, or the fix causes more problems down the road. And so they write a historical discussion of that issue. They need to understand how it happened. Because if you want to fix a problem, you have to understand the problem. And the historical paper allows them to do this. Now, for most of my, um, my students, this isn't a big deal, but sometimes it can be. Because some issues are lengthy and have been, and have been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, gun control. Legislate it, don't legislate it. Can anybody in this room remember when the conversation started? I've read, I don't know how many papers on gun control, don't know what's going on. Abortion, right or wrong, you know. Uh, whether something's legal or not doesn't mean the conversation has ended. And so they need to understand that and they write that paper. So they're writing a historical paper. And at this point I switch gear um, and I do probably the most cruel thing that I can do with, it with students is I can make them use Chicago Turabian uh, as documentation source. And if you've ever gone from MLA or APA to Chicago Turabian, you know what a hassle that can be. We're just not used to it, uh, mostly. Um, but my, my, I have two bachelor's degrees. One was in English, one was in history. I like it. And so we use, we use Chicago Turabian because I want them learning how to, to cite things out. I give them an actual problem they have to overcome. Um, Next, we, we shift back into, into the English realm again, and the next paper is where they look at the opposing sides, and they do a synthesis paper. And they try to find out what the major aspects that are actually being talked about are. 
If you can read two arguments, one from each uh, point of view, Republican and Democrat have, have written something, and there are three things that are talked about in each one of them, you know where the discussion actually is. And so they then go in there and they look at that and they section that out and figure out what's important in this discussion. And after they've done all that, they write their, their final um, short paper, which is where they identify a solution. And I don't let them just tell me what the solution is. They have to come up with a real life application that can solve it. Whether that's one small uh, or one thing that can solve the problem or a, a series of events that can solve the problem, they have to come up with, with a step-by-step -step manual of how we fix this. Now, I'm just naive enough to know, um, after 18 years of teaching English and, and working in this, and 53 years of, of living in a, in a democratic household in a Republican state, um, you know, to think that maybe this next coming generation, the Z generation that we were talking about earlier, just might have a solution to it. Because again, I'm asking them to take the issues that we have and solving them so that the next generation doesn't have to deal with that problem. Because what I'm really asking my students to do in this problem-based idea is to make our political system better, to restore the faith in it. That's really what I'm looking for. And so as they work on these issues, trying to solve problems that um, old gray-haired men in Washington haven't been able to solve in decades, maybe they'll come up with the right idea. Who is it that they're addressing and how do they fix that idea? And so they look at the process and they give a solution for that one. So what is the issue that we're having and how do we solve it? And they can look anywhere in the world for that. Because the one thing that I've learned in, in all the years that I've been doing this is that As smart as we can be in front of that class, and as much as we know about a particular issue or topic, somebody else has another good idea. And so as we are looking for those good ideas, those nuggets that we can harvest and use, they might come up with something that can fix a problem, that can restore the American people's belief in the political system. Because if we, I, I, again, I think if we took a poll, in this room of how many people think that the political system as we have it today is what the founding fathers meant it to be. I don't think we'd have many hands go up to say this is what George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln all thought that it would be. Did John Hancock sign his name saying we must be independent um, and we should have this government set up like this and would they recognize it? And I don't think they would. And I don't think most people think it is. I think there's problems that we need to solve. And so I, I'm going to ask my students to solve those. I'm giving them a real life problem. Um, the nice thing is, is I can incorporate this into my writing classroom. And we can incorporate this into other writing classrooms. Um, research proposal, you know, as we're looking at this one, because now that, now that we're doing this, and now that I'm using and chosen to use, uh, trying to make politics sustainable, or the idea of our political system sustainable for the American people, um, you, know, so, you know, work for us again, um, you know, I'm, I'm crossing over disciplines. And so it means, again, I have, to, I have to be on my toes. I have to be reading. I have to be up on, to date on the issues. I have to be looking at what's going on out there. I have to keep an open mind. And so is the, the things that I have them do, writ, lit review, English, we know, we know where that's coming from. Uh, research proposal is more of a political science type of a, event because of the, the issue matter that they're going to be dealing with. They're going to be dealing with politics. And so they're going to have to learn the language of politics in, in order to do this one. So I'm going to have them reading political documents 
at, at that point in time. They're, they'll find them. They'll bring them up. They'll summarize them. They'll tell me why they're important. They'll tell me why they aren't important. Um, and, and they'll put them up online for everybody to see. They will actually become part of a conversation because I have them blog these, and the blogs have to be open for public consumption. That way they, they are literally have an audience that, that they can have replying to them. Um, and the nice thing is I have each of the students, they have to reply to at least two blogs every week from their fellow classmates. And the, if you know anything about blogs, the more a blog gets hit or, or replied to, the more likely it is to be noticed on the web. And then you start getting outside people from different areas of the country or the world talking to them. So historical, um, again, that's the social science aspect. Synthesis is arts and humanities. And the solution paper is more of a business proposal that I have them write. And, and they write that with the idea that they're going to get more people um, convinced that this is the way that they need to go. So we go back to that original assignment that I have them do the first Wednesday in class is, what is a product that you, that you want? to sell. Who is the audience for that product? And after they know who the audience for that product is, what do you need to do in order to get them to buy into that? And so a real life problem becomes a learning techniques that we can use within our classroom. And I think it's important that we give them something to grab onto. Because I, I, again, and, and, I, and I liked your, your Z generation type of, of proposal that these are people who are looking towards the future. And it's exactly what I found. When I mentioned sustainability and told them what my view of sustainability is, in every single one of my classes, my students have, have blossomed and have been able to grab onto it. They need the problems that they actually care about in order to get into. This is not new stuff. Um, I, wish, I wish that I'd come up with this one. It, it's not. Here's. Um, and I'm not, you know, I use this book because it makes sense to me, but there are a lot more out there. And this is The Power of Problem-Based Learning by uh, Dutch, Grohl, and Allen. And this is what they say when they ta start talking about the, the, prob the problems of power-based learning. They said, the past decade has seen major changes in how we communicate, do business, access information, and use technology. How we, how we teach must also change in order to prepare our students to cope with these new uh, situations. Students need more, than, need more than ever to be able to post questions, seek and find appropriate resources for answering those questions, and communicate their solutions effectively to others. Problem-based learning is just one uh, educational strategy that we can use to reach our students. And so, you know, it's with the idea that we can give them a real issue, a real audience, and an actual problem to solve, they dig into it because they care about what's going to be happening. Most of that Z generation um, that, that we look at, you know, is concerned that what we have now is not going to be there in the future. The, the, we won't have the grasslands to go visit. We can't go up into the mountains. The air is not going to be breathable. We're going to be walking around with masks on. And we've seen in various parts of the world where this has actually happened. In London in 1950, when over 4,000 people died because of the quality of the air. 1,300 people, by the way, this year alone have died in the Los Angeles area because of breathing-related smog issues. It's a political issue. Why aren't these things being governed, or what's standing in the way, or do we want to have them? Um, the hospital, uh, the local hospitals, deal with breathing-related issues on a daily basis. And so we have those things going on. This is just one of those areas that they can deal with. And so as we look at them, we're able to, um, from what I found, students will grab onto them. They give you better papers. Uh, when I switched over to this thing, my students went from good papers to really great papers because they've engaged into something they actually care about. Yes? Well, this, uh, this resonates a lot with my own experience about six years ago, I brought in service learning. Um, they had to do volunteer work or whatever, mm -hmm. and it became their final 
problem solution essay. So it would be at a food bank, or, uh, nursing home. And I got really, and give a report at the end of the semester, and got really good results. But if, that's only about a third of the semester. So I wonder how do students sustain an interest in a particular topic? They do, because I have them do two different things. They have their individual research, which they're, which they're working on. But based upon that individual research, I have them join into groups. And I will have three to four groups where they will get and they will work on um, a group proposal that they will actually pitch outside. And so I'm working on that in, you know, it's as they go along, they do group work to work on that and individual work to work on, on their project. And so the final paper that they will actually give me combines all the shorter papers that I mentioned. Everything comes together and they, shuffle them and they deal them out as best they can. And I found it actually does, you know, if we, if when we get them in there and we allow for the opportunities when they come in, because I will sit down with them now and I will open it up and I'll say, okay, which issue do you want to talk about? And we'll sit in a circle and we will talk about an issue. And we will look at the factors that the, that the, because that the, we, I still need to get them to focus on, on writing in my classroom and on the tools that an author or a, an entity is using to convince somebody else to do something. And so we'll sit down and we'll look at those tools and why they were effective and how they were effective. And so when you intersperse the, all three of them in there, it tends to take up more room and, and they get them. Mind you, most of this is done outside of class. I, I like my students doing it. When they come to class, they need to be ready to, to discuss what they found not necessarily to not work on it, so because they're going to be doing so much group work. Yes? Did you have some type of monitoring system of students' performance? One more time. Did you have any uh, monitoring system for students' performance uh, throughout the semester? For example, if they turn in a small paper, do you keep track of you know, how they did? And then I do. Okay. Yeah, and, and I make sure everything I do is online now, which, which I really like because then students can go back and check it over and over and over again. And I let them know, I say, this is working, you know, and it resonates and, it, and it's making sense that these areas aren't. So they can, they can work on it. And, and again, it's who is your audience? You know, how are you addressing your audience? And, and how are you getting to them? And so I can, check the, I can check their progress. It allows me to find out if there are students that need more help, I can contact them individually and, and give them that, that help. Yes? Question. So if you teach, well, you obviously do teach um, lower level undergraduate mm -hmm. students. If you're t teaching a class where you're essentially supposed to provide information to them, so then when they take those upper level cl classes, they're able to s s synthesize essentially what they learned in those lower cl classes. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to put what you're t talking about into one of those? Like intro to ch chem chemistry, for example. Um, because I'm not dealing with chemistry per se, um, what, what, I, what, I, what I do is, is I have them look at the, the book that we're using. We use it, we, we discuss that, and one of the days we'll, we'll sit down and discuss the, the aspects of the book. We'll take the article, the issue that they're dealing with, and specifically look at these aspects in, in the writing classroom that we're using in the argument. How is the art author, again, you know, you know, addressing uh, claims and warrants. You know, what claim are they making and how are they backing that up? Because that's really important in the, in the research process. And I think they could probably use the same thing when they, when they get into the, the higher level classes because whether it's in chemistry or it's in history or it's in that one, when you start writing a paper, you need to, you know, you make a claim or say, this is what we found, and you need to show your audience how you found that. So I think you probably could. Yes? One more minute. Oh, okay. So sorry. Uh, when you throw a, uh, book, your book away, um, when you talk to your department head, what was um, was there any like you know, was was your idea of having your own curriculum kind of um, tied the line to uh, uh, department's um, goals and mission uh, in terms of accreditation? Yeah, I, I look. At the, the department has their outcome goals and everything else that they need. What I did is when I threw the book away, I went to our library database, and I'm hopefully, hopefully everybody knows where that is, and I literally started reading hundreds of articles. I probably read about 300 articles to come up with the first you know, section that I did, and then I read through more and more as time goes on so I can you know, trade them in and out. So I'm not getting bored with the same thing 
and, and finding something that say, talks specifically about how to make a, uh, how, how warrants back up claims. And so they're out there. And sometimes they're really boring articles, and sometimes they're really good articles. My favorite is, is uh, The Eye of the Beholder. Uh, talks about Pompeii's uh, mythological structure and the paintings they found in the houses as they excavated from the volcano. And so they went and, they, you know, and I have them read that one. So I'm getting signaled. So um, thank you. <laughs>